Stat Quest is super cool. Stat Quest won't make you true. Stat Quest, Stat Quest, guaranteed not to make you drool. Hello, and welcome to Stat Quest. StatQuest is brought to you by the friendly folks in the genetics department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today we're starting part one of our exploration of how Edge R works. We're going to talk about library normalization. Just like DESeq2, Edge R does not use RPKM, TPM, or any of the other standard normalization techniques. This is because it needs to adjust for two things. Sequencing depth, that's what RPKM and all those other methods deal with. It also needs to take library composition into account. This means different samples can contain different active genes and that can change things. I cover this concept in depth in the Stat Quest on DESeq2 Part 1 Library Normalization, so check that out if you have any more questions. Without further ado, let's talk about how Edge R normalizes libraries. Step 1. Remove all untranscribed genes. That is to say, remove all genes with zero read counts in all samples. Here's an example. We've got three samples and five genes. The last gene, gene 5, has zero read counts in all three samples. And so we will remove gene 5 from our list of genes. Step 2. Pick one sample to be the reference sample. This is the sample that we will use to normalize all of the other samples against. Imagine these blue dots are samples, or libraries. Edge R chooses one sample to be the reference sample, and uses it to normalize all of the remaining samples. Here's a question for you. What's a good reference sample? Alternatively, what's a bad reference sample? Here's an example of an extremely bad reference sample. Sample 3 would be a terrible reference sample. Scaling would be based on a single, potentially very noisy, measurement. To avoid choosing extreme samples, Edge R attempts to identify the most average sample. Let's see how it does this. In order to pick a reference sample, the first thing it does is it scales each sample by its total read counts. So here, if we imagine each sample has four genes, we just sum the read counts for each sample, and we divide the original read counts for each gene in each sample by each sample's total. And here's what the scaled read counts look like. The second part of picking a reference sample is for each sample, determine the value such that 75% of the scaled data are equal to or smaller than it. In sample number one, three of the four values, 75%, are less than or equal to 0.26. In sample number two, three of the four values, 75%, are less than or equal to 0.36. Lastly, in sample number three, three of the four values, or 75%, are less than or equal to 0.13. Now we've calculated the 75th quantiles for each sample. The third part of picking a reference sample is to average the 75th quantiles. In this case, the average is 0.25. The reference sample is the one whose 75th quantile is closest to the average. In this case, sample number 1 will be the reference sample. That's because its 75th quantile, 0.26, is closest to the average, 0.25. Now that we've picked a reference sample, we now need to select the genes for calculating the scaling factors. This is done separately for each sample relative to the reference sample. Here we see the reference sample we selected in step number two, and now we will select a set of genes to create a scaling factor for sample number two. And we will select another set of genes to create a scaling factor for sample number three. This is one of the ramifications of EDGEAR's approach. Different samples use different genes to derive their scaling factors. Let's see how we select genes for sample number two. 
we'll start by looking at the different types of genes to choose from. Here's an XY plot that will demonstrate the different types of genes we have to choose from. On the left side, we see a gene primarily transcribed in the reference sample. On the right side, we see a gene primarily transcribed in sample number two. Way up high, we see a gene with a ton of reads in both samples. And way down low, we see a gene with hardly any reads in both samples. Genes in the middle don't have much bias and have a moderate number of reads mapped to them in both samples. Edge R selects the genes in the middle with more effort put into excluding biased genes. Let's see how it does this. We'll start with the scaled read counts. These are the read counts for each gene divided by the sample's total. The next few steps only make sense if there are a lot of genes, too many to put on the screen. So that's what the dot 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 and gene n are all about. They represent lots more genes. Edge R filters out biased genes by looking at log fold differences. Remember, with logs, if the reference is way high relative to sample number two, you'll get a value way up here. And if sample number two is way high relative to the reference, we'll get a value way down here. Ultimately, we'll pick a threshold, like plus or minus six, and remove all genes with more extreme biases. For more information about logs, check out the stat quest on logs. We'll start by calculating the log two ratio for gene number one. Plugging in the scaled read counts, we get the log two of 0 divided by 0 0.9. The log 2 of 0 is defined as negative infinity by R, the programming language that Edge R was written in. So we put negative infinity as the value for gene 1 in our table of log 2 ratios. Now let's calculate the log 2 ratio for gene number 2. Plugging in the scaled read counts gives us the log base 2 of 0 0.8 which equals negative 0.32. And we just do that for every single gene in our list of genes. Now we remove genes with infinite values, i.e. genes without any reads mapping to them in one or both samples. In this example, we'll remove gene number one. Now that we have a table of log ratios to identify biased genes, Let's make a table to identify genes that are highly and lowly transcribed in both samples. To identify genes that are high and low in both samples, first calculate the geometric mean for each gene. Remember, the geometric mean is cool since it is not easily influenced by outliers. More details on the geometric mean are in the stat quest for logs. Anyway, Here's how we calculate the geometric mean for gene number one. We take the average of the log two of the scaled read counts for each sample. Plugging in the numbers gives us negative infinity. That's because there's zero read counts in the reference for gene number one. And we put that value in our table of the mean of the logs. Technically, we are not calculating the geometric mean since we are not converting the average back into normal number land but the effect is the same. Outliers are less influential on the value that we are keeping track of. Here's how we calculate the mean of the logs for gene number two. And then we calculate the mean of the logs for all of the other genes in the list. Now remove all genes with infinite values, i.e. genes without any reads mapping to one or more samples. In this case, that means we will be removing gene number one. Now we have two tables, one to identify biased genes, that's the log of the ratio between the two samples, and one to identify genes that are highly and lowly transcribed in both samples, and that's the mean of the logs. Now sort both tables from low to high. Filter out the top 30% and the bottom 30% of the biased genes and filter out the top 5% and the bottom 5% of the highly and lowly transcribed genes. Genes that are still in both lists are used to calculate the scaling factor. Unfortunately, 
the only genes in this example that are in both lists are the dot 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 genes. But you get the idea. Hooray! We figured out which genes to use to scale sample number two. Now we need to figure out which genes to use for sample number three. I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader. Now that we've figured out which genes we're going to use to create a scaling factor, we can move on to step four. Calculate the weighted average of the remaining log two ratios. For your information, Edge R calls this the weighted trimmed mean of the log two ratios because we trimmed off the most extreme genes. By excluding extreme genes, we avoid the effect of outliers, sort of like using the geometric mean. Okay, so we're back to talking about sample number two. And imagine genes A through Z are the dot 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 genes. These are the genes that made it through the filters in step three. Once you have selected which genes will be used to calculate the scaling factor, just calculate the weighted average of their log two ratios. Genes with more reads mapped to them get more weight. This is because log ratios have more variance with low read counts. Let's look at an illustration. Here we have a table of read counts for sample number one and sample number two. We've got six genes, and on the right side we show the log two ratio between the two samples. The first three genes have relatively high read counts. However, the difference between gene number one and gene number three is four. The bottom three genes have relatively low read counts. However, the difference between gene four and gene six is also four. Now in the right hand column we see the log two ratios, and when there are lots of reads, small differences in read count do not make big log fold differences. When there are only a few reads, small differences in read counts can make big log fold differences. So we're back to calculating the weighted average of the log two ratios. Genes with more reads mapped to them get more weight because they're less noisy. And then we do the same thing for sample number three. We calculate the weighted average of the log two ratios. We're almost done. Step five, convert the weighted average of the log two ratios to normal numbers. That is to say, we raise two to the weighted average of the sample two log two ratios. That gives us a scaling factor. However, this is not quite the scaling factor that EDGEAR reports. We also calculate a scaling factor for sample number three. And we continue to do that for all the samples in our data set. Here are actual scaling factors that I calculated from an RNA-seq experiment. We see that WT2 was used as the reference sample. The other samples were scaled to it. One step. Step six, center the scaling factors around one. Here are our raw scaling factors. The values are roughly centered around 0 0.95. And here are the final centered scaling factors. They've been shifted over so that they are centered on one. The centering is done by dividing each raw scaling factor by their geometric mean. Although centering does not change the results, Mark Robinson, the guy who wrote this method, says it gives the scaling factors some nice mathematical properties. So I guess it's a sort of artistic signature on a mathematical formula. That's it. Now you know how scaling factors are calculated in EDGE-R. Tune in next time for another exciting stat quest.